Um, so I want to start with a joke by my favorite comedian. You may have heard of him, Brian Regan. Um, you'll, you'll see, it's appropriate, I promise. <clears throat> okay, gotta get into transform into comedian mode. All right. So I think one of the strangest parts of the greeting card store is the section called new baby. I don't think you need the word new, right? Like you have to clear up confusion. Uh, do you have a, an old baby section? Because, uh, well, my friend had a baby and uh, I let time get away from me. And he's 12. <laughs> Is there an area of your establishment? So, all right. So the reason I tell that joke is that today is the day of Epiphany, which is the closest Sunday that we have to the twelfth day after Christmas, which represents when the Magi or wise men reach the baby Jesus and Mary. Now in reality, they probably arrived around two years late, so they could have used one of those old baby cards. <laughs> we know this because later Herod had all the children under the age of two in and around Bethlehem killed thinking that one of them might be the ordained king of the Jews. Luckily, Jesus and family had likely returned to Nazareth in the Gospel of Luke by that time. So why were they so late? Well, they probably had to travel at least a few hundred miles after they met. Since they were following a star, they could only travel by night, and they were on camels. But still, you wouldn't think it would take much more than a couple months. So they must have had a lot to do on the way. Lots of stops. But regardless, the amazing thing is that they would travel so long and so far just to see a young child that they believed to be the king of the Jews. What's more, they were Gentiles. One would think that king of the Jews would not really mean much to them. But they made the trip because they believed in the sign. Can you imagine walking several hundred miles and taking up two, year li two years of your life to get anywhere? Maybe you can if you've done a walkathon or marathon somehow for that many miles, but... I certainly couldn't. Uh, now, I am no stranger to tardiness. I often find myself rushing to get somewhere at the last minute because I got sidetracked or overly invested in something I was working on. In fact, when I told Jacob the title of my sermon so he could put it on the sign, he told me, that fits you well. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Appreciate it. But being late really stresses me out. I imagine most people feel the same way. Sometimes it's because you could get in trouble at school or work. Sometimes it's because you don't want to miss something. Sometimes it's simply that you want to be respectful of people's time. And sometimes it's just because you don't want to ruin the experience for everyone else. When you're a teenager, let's be honest, the reason for tardiness is often apathy. When I was in high school, I was not dying to watch my English teacher walk around the room passing out essay prompts. Although the idea of, say, getting one more tardy and having to go to detention is a pretty stressful thing. That only happened once, I think, <laughs> that I can remember. But most of the time, our desire to be on time, I think, shows a respect and a commitment to the event or task at hand. There are those who come fashionably late to a party or something, and in a situation like that, of course it's all right. But I have to say, if I'm hosting some sort of youth party or event, and a kid comes in out of breath and excited, brings a smile to my face no matter what time they arrive tells me that that person really wants to be there. This is how I think one should see the level of commitment of the wise men in the Gospel of Matthew. The simple sight of a star in the sky, prophesying something that in theory would have little to no effect on them, led them to make a journey that I can't really imagine making myself. It's remarkable. True, at the time people had to walk hundreds of miles to get anywhere, and they didn't have quite as much to occupy their time. But nonetheless, it's a lot to do based only on a symbol in the night sky. Around this time of year, many of us make New Year's resolutions. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But when I do, I always think about how exact it has to be. Does it have to be right when the New Year begins? This is true for Lent as well. I always think, ah, it's already Lent, and I don't know what to give up. Or, ah, it's 2019, and I haven't figured out a resolution. Also, ah, it's 2019, that's crazy. <laughs> It's partly due to an obsessive personality, and partly due to the nature of resolutions. 
But then I think about it for a minute and realize it's ridiculous to worry too much about setting an arbitrary timetable for such a thing. If you're to jump into, late a few, into Lent a few, de few days late, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as the intention and purpose behind the thing you're giving up is good. Maybe just continue doing it that many days after Lent has passed, if you feel the need. Usually, a New Year's resolution is something that you generally want to change about yourself that will last beyond the year. So really, if you come up with it a couple months in, why is that a problem? If you're doing something good for yourself or for someone else, why should it matter how early or late you started? Now, to me, that brings to mind Jesus' parable of the prodigal son in the Gospel of Luke. If you don't know it, in the story, at his youngest son's request, a man divides up his property between his two sons. Now, the youngest one goes off and squanders the money on a somewhat debaucherous lifestyle. But once he spends everything, he has no money left for food due to a famine. He begins working elsewhere and is given very little. He knew that his father had plenty to give, so he decides to return to his father and apologize for his behavior and ask for forgiveness. Rather than reprimand him, his father is filled with compassion and embraces him and throws a party. His eldest son was upset about this because he felt his brother did not deserve the reception of God. He got while he had been present working for his father his whole life. His father said, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And that says a lot about the nature of God. It's never too late to come back to God. According to Jesus, one should not be reprimanded for their initial absence, but welcomed with open arms and celebrated for their return. And similarly, it's never too late to make a change or start something good. Start your New Year's resolution a couple months in. Now, around this time of year, I tend, apparently, to harp on the uh, story of Car Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Good amount. Uh, but in the story, of course, Ebenezer Scrooge made his transformation quite late in life. It's a great example of the opportunity each of us has. The intention behind your transformation, the intention behind your return, is what is ultimately important. It's never too late to try and make things right. Now, if the significance lies in the intention, then in the case of the wise men, their gifts would have been even more meaningful due to the timing of their arrival. It showed that to them... To worship the Son of God, the proclaimed King of the Jews, was of the utmost importance. That they would spend years traveling to see the old baby says that it is the most important thing that they could have possibly done. How strong was their faith? Now, if you were here on Christmas Eve, uh, Reverend Baugh told a story about the other wise man, which was written in 1895 by Henry Van Dyke. So I'll just short briefly as I can. The story tells of a fourth wise man who intends to bring gifts of pearl, ruby, and sapphire to the baby Jesus. However, on the way to the meeting spot with the other magi, he stops to help a dying man, and the caravan leaves without him. He has to sell one of his items to pay for a camel and supplies. Then he arrives in Bethlehem after Jesus, Mary, and Joseph have left. But while he is there, he spends another one of his gifts to save the life of a child. It takes 33 years of traveling around and performing charitable works, but he arrives in Jerusalem where Jesus is being crucified. While there, he has to sell the pearl to save a girl from being sold into slavery. He then gets hit in the head by a falling roof tile and is dying, thinking that he has failed. But he hears a voice, Truly I tell you, that which you have done for the least of these, you have done for me. He dies peacefully. The story is wonderful, and I thank Reverend Baugh for sharing it on Christmas Eve. This takes the acts of the Magi to the extreme, and he receives a just reward for spending his life searching for Jesus, physically and metaphorically. Finally, what mattered was the journey, why and how he made it. And there it is. The truth is ultimately that the significance of the journey of the wise men is underscored by its purpose and not by its outcome. They were not going to give gifts to a king in a palace of gold. They were going to give gifts to a modest child with his mother in a home. They were not going with Herod's intentions in mind to remove the possibility of another contender for the throne of king of the Jews. They went with the intention to worship the child who would one day take up that mantle 
and bring the Jewish people back to a kingdom like that which existed during the time of David. And that is no less true for us. The nobility of each of our journeys can be traced back to understanding its intention. Its timing, how late we started or arrived, does not matter. At any point in life, the opportunity exists to depart on a journey toward fulfillment of some inner prophecy, be it biblical or self-created. If you see that star in the sky seeming to point in a direction that you know is right, you could follow it, no matter how long it takes to get there. There's even a chance that it might be fulfilled along the way. Thank you. Amen.